Lord gave me a word for this church and for you guys individually at the sound of my voice. And uh, I, I wrote it out. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. And you can sit or you can stand, whatever you feel comfortable with. But I just want the music to still play and for us to stay in this atmosphere. You have been pushing and pressing and persevering despite the fact that you have not seen or received what you hope for. You have walked through the wilderness and you have not turned back, nor have you settled for second best. You have constantly kept on contending for more whilst you have not seen the more, but you kept knowing there is more. Constantly saying, there must be more. This is the promise of God. Now I will cause you to break through, not just into the place of the more, but into the place where all things are possible. Here you don't have to climb ladders and push anymore. Here you fly and move in a way you have never moved before. Here you enter into the things you have never entered into before. This is the infinite place where there is no limits, no barriers, the supernatural zone of the unknown which is my very intimate presence, my deepest heart. This is the place I prepared for you. This is the new. You can come in as deep as you want into my heart and into the flow of my love from where you will now live and flow. Come, jump into my river. Do not resist. Lay back and let the streams take you. From here you will receive power and authority to influence all dimensions of physical and spiritual reality. You will be able to breathe life and shine light into every atmosphere. I have given you the breath of life and I take you now into a place of limitless and infinite possibilities. It is time for you to rise up and become the person I created you to be. It is time to rise up and go beyond the limitations of your current reality. It is time to supersede the natural reality and walk with me in the supernatural you were made to operate on a higher level you were made to create with me that is why i am breaking all yokes and bondages because in this place you need to be free to soar with me you have to be free in this place because the free in me are free to do whatever they want because you carry my heart that is that what you want is exactly what i want no more lack or worry about not having enough. You have to learn to operate in this place of abundance that I'm taking you, but still in a relational obedience. Relationships will take on new meaning to you as you begin to see and experience things and people differently. I'm setting you ablaze. I'm blowing on the gifts. We will work together as friends to accomplish the greater things. We will, fly, we will fill those heavenly treasuries and you will walk in the fullness of your inheritance and my gifts and presence will explode on you there's something breaking open in the spirit you can feel it you can taste it it is here and you are ready to enter i'm a mighty warrior and i give you what is yours and i give you your harvest let washing upon washing and refreshing upon refreshing now flow over you and into you but this i ask that you will now take responsibility for what i will now give i will help you and i will be with you but you have to take responsibility only those who will take and bear the responsibility will truly be able to walk in this my yoke is soft and my burden is light but there is still a responsibility to bear this is your hour your season your time to do the impossible for me I am looking for those with integrity who will step up and restore the integrity of my kingdom on this earth. And then the question of the Lord, will you take responsibility with me? And that's it. Thank you, Lord, for this word. I just release it into this atmosphere and over this people. And I speak, Lord, that, that none of the words that were spoken over them will fall to the ground. And thank you, Lord, that you are welcome in this place today. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. You do. Um, I know the word that I read was a bit long, um, but, but go and re-listen it, because it's something that God had me write out. So I couldn't skip a part or just go and speak on it or anything. But, but um, I, uh, I wasn't sure what to, to preach on. And then the Lord said to me, but speak about some things in the word. Um, because we were contending for the more, we had the more confidence, and um, God actually gave this word for me some time back. So when that started happening, I knew the timing was right for this to come. And um, this was actually God saying to us and, and for me in my heart that, listen, I'm going to give you guys the more. I'm, I'm going to give you, I'm going to allow you to step into more now. I'm going to allow you to, to, to get into those deeper places, to experience more things and for more things to start happening. But then like the word ended off, it just wants us in that place to know that we still need to take responsibility for what needs to happen. Meaning that if God wants to release more on the earth, it's not just like it's just going to automatically happen. He loves his church and he loves his people, so he positions us for that more. So that means that there is a responsibility and a readiness that we also have to have to partner with him in order to do that. Every blessing that God has given me was so great and so awesome, but it comes with a responsibility. Do you know that? And he gives you the grace to bear the responsibility, but there is still a responsibility to bear. You can pray for God for a child for years, and God will give you the child, but that child comes with a responsibility. So it's the blessing of the Lord, and he's going to give you the grace and the provision and everything to grow and make that child and, and launch the child into life, but there's still a responsibility. And that's exactly so with the more that we are contending for. God's more is more of him. Meaning it's more of his presence, it's more of his substance, it's more of who he is. And, and, and when that starts happening to you and in an atmosphere and in a church, everything changes. Everything changes. I promise you, everything will change when this starts kicking in. And then we need to be prepared for it. We cannot just, that's why so many moves and so many things of God have stopped and have shipwrecked is because... Um, the, the, there was not that place where the responsibility and the integrity was there. And interesting that God said to me in the word that I want to restore the integrity of my kingdom. And I said to God, but your kingdom already has integrity, God. You, you, your whole kingdom is built on integrity. So how can you? And God said, it's not a, it's not a problem with my kingdom, Ukert. It's the problem with my kingdom on the earth. The integrity of the kingdom on my earth and how people view my kingdom on this earth. Because when people look at God and when they want to see God, they look at us. They look at the church. So if the church is not walking in a place where we're taking responsibility and where we walk in, don't walk in integrity, then people of the world are going to look and say, but listen, that we, we don't want anything to do with this. And, and we see a lot of that. Um, a lot of that is starting to be repaired, but I still believe there's more that God wants us to tap into. So I just want us to look at this word integrity. And I went to look in the dictionary of the meaning. I always do this, so this, uh, you guys just have to uh, bear with me. Uh, integrity is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. The quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. Now, for us as kingdom peoples, we can just add that little extra, having strong moral kingdom principles. Um, the state of being whole and undivided. That means that you are undivided in your devotion to something. If you are in a state of wholeness, that means you are holy and you're undivided towards certain things things. So if you're in the kingdom, that means you cannot stand with one foot in the, in the world and with one foot in the kingdom. You have to make a decision. It's either the kingdom or the world. You cannot compromise. So there's a, a large part of the church that is stuck in a bit of compromise, and God wants to deal with that compromise in the season so that we can you can drop them all and we are not going to be uh, in a place where we, we cannot carry it. He loves us too much to give us something that we cannot bear. I, I'm trusting you. It's not, there's no negative thing in God. There's no judgment in God. He paid for all your sins. He paid everything. But there's still that place where he wants you to take responsibility for certain things. So a person of integrity is what? Is a faithful and trustworthy person. 
the word Jesus uses actually is he says, your yes must be yes and your no must be no. How, many, how much of that do we see really in the world today? I'm, I'm, I'm a law person, so I deal with people. And I promise you, for the simplest transactions these days, you have to have the most complicated contracts. You, for a simple transaction, it's a 10-page contract that you're drafting. Why? Because you cannot trust people anymore. You have to make provision for every eventuality that the person is not going to do what he says he's going to do. And you have to contract that in 10 pages. Where God says, let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. How many people do you find today that you, you want to buy a house and you will speak to a person? There will be a written contract. People will, they would have sold the house. Then people will go and fight you in court to get out of that contract. And what's their reason? Now I got a better offer. <laughs> I got a better offer. So you back out of a written agreement. That's not integrity. You'll speak to people about buying a car and, and, and you'll agree on a price and everything is fine. Just to hear the next day, but now I've sold it to somebody else because I got a better offer. Um, in, the, in, the, in the civil industry, the contract business with the tenders and everything, it's become normal practice for people to just, you know, I pay to get the contract because... Everybody does it. If I don't do it, then, then I'm not going to get to work. That's not God's way. <laughs> That's compromised in your integrity. A lot of people duck and dive income tax just because they say, but yeah, we've got, a, we've got a government that's wasting the money and they're not using the money right, so why should I give my money to them? So there's always a reason for people to not walk in integrity. So <laughs> I hope it it, it challenges you, but because it challenges me to a place to say and to go and sit and, and, and check and evaluate. Am I doing things right? Because you must remember, listen to this scripture. Uh, Proverbs 11 verse 3, New King James Version. That first part of the scripture there. The integrity of the upright will guide them. The integrity of the upright will guide them. So if you walk in integrity... That integrity and God will guide you towards a predestined destination. So if you're struggling with direction, if you're struggling with the way that you're going, if you're meeting a lot of opposition, go and check your integrity as well. Go and check that everything is in place because what? Integrity will guide you. Integrity will guide you. And a lot of the people in the world and our country is lost <laughs> because there's no integrity. So in what direction are you moving? Uh, check the direction and just go and check. It's not a place of judgment. Just go and check that everything is in place. Proverbs, um, uh, Psalms 25, uh, 21, uh, do not do NIV version. My integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope, Lord, is in you. Integrity protects you. There's protection in walking in, 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 in integrity. Psalms 41 verse 12. Also NIV do not do. Because of my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. You know why a lot of people struggle to get in the presence of God? It's because there's something wrong in their walk of integrity and uprightness with God. So they sit in a place where they actually feel guilty. And they feel condemned and they don't feel that they have liberty to enter into the presence of God. But we're going to deal with how to just repair that because it's not difficult. But because of my integrity, you uphold me. Do you want God to uphold you? Integrity will cause him to do that for you. And he will set him in his presence forever. So we can see that integrity with God is actually quite important. Um, Psalm 78 verse 72, also NIV. Sorry, I'm just throwing some scriptures at you so that you can see that I'm not. It says, now David, this is the type of leaders that God is looking for in this hour, in the church specifically, and then also in the world. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands he led them. You can see there, what is integrity of heart? That is a guy that has strong moral kingdom principles. So he's got strong moral principles in place, and that's the way he guides and leads the people. So the people cannot go astray because he's got the right principles and the right moral values and the honesty intact 
to provide the correct guidance to people. And that's what God wants from us as a church as well. When he brings the people, they must come here and they must see people with strong Christian kingdom values that push them to walk in the right direction and, 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 and walk in, in the favor that God has for them. Then the second part of the word that I gave, God spoke about taking responsibility. Now, responsibility is actually the duty to deal with something. So if God gives you responsibility, stewardship will be a very important component of that. And also being accountable. Being accountable for what God has entrusted to you. Because the person that's responsible is the person that is in authority. If you are in the position of authority, then it means you are accountable. Uh, the, the best verse that I could find there uh, to, to just explain for me what a responsible person would be is Daniel 6 verse 4, do not do in the NIV. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel. Now, Daniel was appointed by King Nebuchadnezzar um, uh, yeah, in, a, in a very high governmental position. And obviously, these people were not happy with it. So they were looking for, for reasons to get him out. So look, look what the word says there. Um, they were looking for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. <laughs> How many church and government leaders do you think will pass that test this day? <laughs> Specifically the government leaders. Do have people go and absolutely look for something wrong, but they cannot find anything wrong with what you've done. They could not find any corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Okay, so... It may sound like stuff that you feel that, listen, but will I ever be able to do this? God's not expecting you to be perfect. He is giving you His Holy Spirit and His grace to help you to walk the walk of faith and the Christ life. So, yeah, don't, don't, be, don't be scared if I, if I throw out this stuff. Uh, it's actually a challenge for us, and it's actually an invitation to, to, to get deeper into God. Um, when... God, Adam and Eve was in, in, in the garden. They um, had free freedom from God to eat of every tree except for one. So there was one tree that was forbidden. We all know they ate of the forbidden tree. Now, listen what happens when God comes to Adam and speaks to Adam uh, about it. God asks him, have you, have you ate from the tree that was forbidden? And then in, in, in Genesis 2 verse 12, listen to this crafty answer of uh, of Adam, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit uh, of the tree and I ate it. Can you see what Adam does there? He immediately, he immediately diverts. He immediately shifts the blame. And not just towards Eve, but towards God indirectly as well. He's saying, the woman that you put here with me, <laughs> this is the cause of it. Now, what's the problem with that? What do you think? What do you think was Satan's end goal? Yeah, was was it to to just get people into sin? What was he really after? What was he after? He was after something, and that's the same thing that is still after in your life today when you are being checked in places where where, where you have to stand and where you're responsible. What do you think would have happened if Adam would have taken responsibility? What do you think would have happened? I think if we're going to look at one or two of the other stories that I'm going to bring out, you're going to see what would have happened. But I believe God would have forgiven him. And I believe God would have restored him. Why does God go? You can check it. God goes to Adam first. Why does God speak to Adam first? Because Adam was the one that he put in authority. He was the one that he gave instruction. So the moment Adam shifted, the moment he diverted, the moment he blame shifted, the moment he did that, he gave away his authority, <laughs> he lost his authority, so the moment he lost his authority, who was the second person, because who did he give, who did he give, uh, shame, he gave it to Eve, he said it's the woman, so immediately the woman is the one who's in authority now, so God speaks to Eve, and he says to Eve, Eve what happened, and what does Eve do, she says now, it's the snake. Immediately, Satan has got authority. That's how Adam lost authority. 
And that's how Satan got authority of the world. <laughs> My challenge to you sometime, for, to us, is to, to go and look where you have given away your authority. Where are the places where you, where you, where you uh, have fallen trapped to being in a victim mentality or to just shift the blame? It's somebody else. Um, and, and, and the problem with that is that that's exactly what the enemy wants. Because once you do that, then immediately you've given away your authority and you're in the place where God cannot help you with that specific problem anymore. That's why God couldn't restore it there. He couldn't do it. <laughs> they, they would not take responsibility. And the thing is, God is seriously and intently in this season dealing with this and He's dealing with this in the church as well. Because, as I've said, he wants us to, to take us into this place where we experience a greater glory, where we walk in more authority. Because with that more responsibility, he's giving us more authority. So the moment he comes in and he gives you more glory and he comes deeper in his presence, then suddenly you've got more authority to deal with stuff. But you still have a responsibility to bear in that place. And the only people that can bear the weight of this responsibility is this that God showed me, is the people that choose holiness and purity and the reverential fear of the Lord and those that are chosen by Him. That is the people, the bridal company, those that are willing to, to, to lay it all down in passionate pursuit of their bridegroom. Those that want to, to, to walk in that place. But you're going to say to me, listen, Ukert, but um, Jesus made me pure. I don't have to do anything extra. That is true. He made you pure. But your walk in purity on the earth is, 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 is dependent on you walking in that purity. Because if you're going to continue sinning and having to, to, to receive grace for your sins, then you're actually at the place where you're going to constantly deal with with the consequences of that sin and the problems that you're facing as a consequence of what's going wrong. The second part of what I said is that he, he, God didn't, um, it's those that are chosen by him. It's very important for us individually and as a church to be positioned for what God wants to do. Meaning that every part of the body, God will put in place to do what they are supposed to do. This is not a season for us to self-appoint or to push, push for position. And that's a warning that God also gave me, is to tell people to be patient, to allow God to put you in your specific calling and in your specific place. We all have a general call. That's like going to the hospital, praying for the sick. The general call of God is for all of us. But then there's specific stuff that you are called to do in God. That specific stuff is stuff that he's preparing you specifically for and allow him to take you through the process to get you into that. Um, one of the best examples of a person that didn't wait or didn't want to wait his turn or self-appointed himself for me in the Bible is Absalom. I don't know if you ever read that story. Go and read the story of Absalom and David. Absalom was actually David's son and um, he didn't wait for his turn or for God to appoint him as king. He decided to make his own move to become king. And he set himself up. He actually went to the city gates and he started lying to the people that was coming to his father for judgment in their cases. And he said, the king cannot hear you. But then he said to them, but if I am king, I will hear your case and I will do this and I will do that. So he was over a period of time stealing the hearts of the people away from um, from, from David and, and, and putting himself in position and in the end he made a political move to become king but it cost him his life it cost him his life in the end so, so this is not a season where you can self appoint where you can push for position this is a season where you have to just go with the flow and allow God to take you where you need to be and trust him that he's got the best in hand for you Jesus himself didn't self appoint do you know that Jesus had so many prophecies about his life that he was going to be the savior of the world and those prophecies and everything was in the word and it was given by his birth and it was given when he was still a young child but he never stepped out in ministry or did anything before God called him out 
on 30, he was there when, when John was baptizing the people. And John was busy baptizing the people and he was speaking about the Christ that is to come. And he was saying that you will be the Lamb. And Jesus was there. You could have said, okay, here I am, it's me. Don't look anymore, it's me. He didn't do that. He waited until John pointed him out and said, behold, the Lamb of God. And then, what happened then? The Holy Spirit came and God himself appointed him and said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. So it's not a place where, where we can do stuff and, and, and just think, yeah, God needs the anointed person to do the job in the season. Because it's the anointing that's going to break the yoke and it's the anointing that sets the people free. We have to get the anointed people to do what they're supposed to do. I remember when Daniel was here and he asked, what was revival? And my answer to him was immediately, revival for me is every person in the body of Christ being in their perfect position, doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. I don't know, maybe that's not revival, maybe that's just one part of it. But for me, yeah, that is part of it. Yeah, a lot of people are scared of the time that we're living in. And, 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 and they, they ask questions and they will say to me, oh, but, but listen, okay, what do I need to build? What do I need to do? So if you want to build something in the season, build this kingdom. There's a lot of people preparing for stuff that they think is going to happen. And, and when I ask God, how do I need to prepare? God said to me, prepare my people, build my kingdom. If you do that, the promise of God is, if you will take care of my business, I will take care of your business. But we still too busy trying to take care of our own business. Most of the people trying to jump out now and do, do stuff, God said to me, don't even listen to them because the base from where they are driving is, um, uh, what do you call it, self-preservation. If there's any self-preservation in your plans that you're making, then you're not busy with God's kingdom plan. You have to follow the kingdom plan in the season because that's the thing that's going to stand. God's shaking and only that which is birthed from his kingdom will stand. So making your own little plan for self-preservation is going to get you nowhere. It may be a good plan, but it's not going to be the, the, the plan that's going to work. You have to be with God's plan in this season. So it's a good, good time to serve God. <laughs> sorry, you guys. I see everybody is quiet. I hope it's not too hard. I'm sorry, but yeah, it's what I need to share. And uh, it's hopefully, I, I'm trying to do it in love. Uh, <laughs> This is my loving face. <laughs> I, another example that I just want us to look at is also the example of the difference that there is between Saul and David um, and, and, and how they approached their positions of responsibility and authority. When we, uh, Saul was the first king, Samuel anointed him as king, there came a point where they were required to go out and fight the Amalekites. And the instruction to Saul was utterly destroy them. Everyone, everything, nothing must be left. Uh, interesting, and maybe I'll mention it a bit later again, the, the word Amalekite, the spiritual meaning of, of Amalekites is flesh. It's the flesh. So if God is spiritually speaking to a soul church, he would say, say to that church, get rid of of your fleshly compromises. <laughs> Get rid of mixture. Get rid of compromise. Okay, so that's, that's what the Amalekite spirit is. That's what the Amalekites mean in the spirit. But okay, Saul got instruction to destroy and we know he didn't do it. He partially destroyed everything, but he kept the best of the, of, of, of the animals and he also kept their king alive. So Samuel comes and Samuel sees that Saul was not obedient. Now in 1 Samuel 15, verse 14 to 16, um, we see that Samuel confronts Saul now, but listen how Saul deals with the fact that he is being confronted with the fact that he was not obedient now. So Saul explains his sin to Samuel. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? and the lowing of the oxen which I hear. Listen now to Saul's answer. This guy was on a next level than Adam and Eve. <laughs> and Saul said, 
they have brought them from the Amalekites. Immediately he diverts um, and he, he shifts the blame. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to God. So listen to the layers and layers of, 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 of blame shifting. First he says, it's them. They did it. Then he says, the people, they did it. And then he says, but they, they kept, we kept the best. Just to make it, you know, to minimize the offense a bit. And then he said, and to sacrifice to God. So he's actually adding a religious purpose to his, um, to, to, to his disobedience now. And, and, but the fact of the matter is, that he was dishonest. So Samuel goes and Samuel further confronts him. And then he admits actually, and he says, okay, I admit that I've sinned, but look what he says then. I was afraid of the people, so I give in to them. So now he gives a reason. He still doesn't take responsibility. He still says it's the people, but now he gives us his reason. He says, I was afraid of the people. And if you have to go and look at the story, Saul's life was never in danger. Saul's life was never in danger. There was never a threat from his people to his life. So why was he scared of the people? He was scared of what they were going to think of him. <laughs> he was scared of their opinion. He was scared of how they were uh, they're going to view him. So he was not there to please God. He was there to please the people. So in this season, you cannot be, you cannot be a people's pe people pleaser. I think Dion said that he also... Um, did a, a lot about this fear of man. But I just want you to look at this. Proverbs 29 verse 25. The fear of man brings a snare. The fear of man brings a snare. Now, how does the fear of man... It, it doesn't say the fear of man is the snare. It says it brings a snare. Because that's what Adam did with Eve uh, and them as well. And that was what happened to Saul as well. Was the enemy really... Uh, at the place where he wanted Saul to be scared of the people, was that his end game with Saul? Or what was the snare? A snare is something that's hidden. It's a trap. It's a trap that he sets for you. And the trap's purpose, so the fear of man was not the, was not the, the end goal. It was just a trap. And once Saul put his feet in the trap, what happened? He gave away his authority. <laughs> he was after Saul's authority. And look what happened to Saul. This is the place where he lost his kingdom and his kingship. <clears throat> this is the place where God replaced him. So can you see how this enemy can successfully divert and um, come in and take moves of God, things that God has given to people and how he can shift and take control of that? Put it in the wrong direction. Put it in the wrong place. So it's the place where God's not saying there's something. He says that, okay, I want you guys to know this. It's the place where he prepares you beforehand because he doesn't want to give you the more. And you get to the place where you're not positioned. And then in the end, the enemy gets in and he stops the thing. Okay. So that's why the Lord is teaching his people in the season to take responsibility what we must understand of God is that this is not a place of judgment when God comes and he deals with stuff with you this place this place is not a place where God judges you he already paid the full price for your sins but it is the place of correction where he may show you where you made a mistake and where he wants you to take responsibility. So why does he do that? To judge you? No. He wants to impart to you the grace to change. Remember, grace is God's unearned, unmerited favor, but it's also his supernatural enablement. But for, in, for God to be able to give you grace to change in a situation, you have to own up to a certain end of wrong decisions and faults that you have made. Not because he's judging you, because he wants to stop the cycle of failures. He wants to show you, listen, this is the weakness. If you can admit it before me, I can give you the grace to change. Okay. That's how God allows you and helps you to change. So can you see what a trap of the enemy it is to get people trapped into a victim mentality? 
into a mentality where they shift blame the whole time. Because in that place, God cannot help you. He cannot help you. Why? Because you are not willing to see the problem. <laughs> if you don't see the error, I mean, I've, I've dealt with this with God so many times in my life. I promise you, then I will deal in relationships. I made a lot of mistakes in my life. I, I, I walked a difficult path, causing me to have to work through difficult relationships and difficult restorations in relationships. And some of them had to happen remotely. And for me, it was difficult because at first I prayed for God to change the people on the other side. I, I prayed for God, listen God, just change their hearts, just change this. And then God showed me, no, Uker, I'm dealing <coughs> with you first. I'm dealing with you first. And, and the moment God showed me, and I said to God in certain circumstances, but God, in this specific circumstance, I, I, I used to debate with God, said, in this sense, I was only 10% wrong. This person is 90% wrong. <laughs> and then God said to me, Uker, with you, I'm only dealing with you with that 10%. Forget about, you cannot change the other person, but you can change what's going on in your heart. But the first step in that is to be able to own up and take responsibility and to look into and to see, okay, this is, this is what's happening. So at the, at the moment you do that, God allows you to view the person on the other side in another place. He gives you suddenly the anointing to set the captives free. He gives you the ability to see from their perspective. And suddenly you experience situations and people differently. And with me what happened is, the moment the change happened in me, suddenly the change started happening on the other side. Unexplainably, huh? but that's how the kingdom works. God showed me that's how the kingdom works. He, he changes it within you. And the more kingdom in you, the more it affects your atmosphere and your environment around you. So it's the kingdom inside that actually forces the kingdom outside. It's the kingdom in here that builds the kingdom around you. So a lot of the changes that we want to see happen has to happen here first. I remember, um, yeah, this, like I say, in the relationships, I, I really had a hard time in dealing with some of the people, but um, I remember I was at the, uh, at the teaching of a guy one time, I don't know, maybe one of, some of you know him, and if I'm going to speak a bit incorrectly now, I, I hope you'll forgive me, <coughs> but I'm trying to remember what happened now, because the Holy Spirit is highlighting it now to me. It was, um, I was at a, uh, we were in Douglas, and the guy that was preaching there was Willem Nell. He's a pastor of um, every nation in Ochefstroom. And a uh, lovely guy, great faith guy. And uh, I actually bought his book. I was so impressed with him. And, uh, and I read it. And his testimony is one of transformation of cities and transformation of regions. And, and what it boils down to is that if you want to transform a city and if you want to transform a region, you have to transform the hearts of the people because the kingdom is in the hearts of the people. Now, what he does is uh, if he goes into a city... He says the, the state of the streets is actually, and the infrastructure is an indication for him always spiritually of what's going on in the hearts of the people. <clears throat> I don't know what we're going to say about Kimberley then. <laughs> Which is not a negative thing. He prayed for us over that weekend, and I promise you, as a testimony to what he prayed for, that next morning, the municipality repaired that whole street around the church. Nobody arranged for that. Nobody asked for that. When they went into um, Potschefstroom and he started his ministry, he didn't know where to start, and God said to him, go to the rubbish dumps. Go to the rubbish dumps and minister to the people there. So they started a rubbish dump ministry <laughs> and minister to the people there. And then suddenly doors started opening up for them with people that's got funds and stuff. And the people got changed. They planted the church. And that area is now one of the most prosperous areas in Potschefstroom. It used to be a rubbish dump. But they didn't go and collect money to go and build a nice place there. 
they went in and they changed the hearts of those people that were there. And when that happened, the kingdom started manifesting. The kingdom started manifesting. Listen to this scripture. Luke 6 verse 39 to 42. He also told this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at me at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. What do I want you to see here? Is that God deals with you first. He once in South Africa, he said to me, Okert, I want you to tell the people that I want to make those whom they now perceive to be their enemies to be at peace with them. But I want them to allow me to change their hearts first. That's where it's going to happen. We, we, we hear of so many controversial issues today that's being discussed. And, and if you look at, um, uh, at, at the way it's being done, um, you know, people debate it. And God said to me in my heart, look at debate and apologetics is not going to change people's hearts. If you want to see something changed, if you think something is controversial, Come to me, let me change your heart first, then I will give you the anointing to step out and set the captives free. That's the way he wants to do it. <clears throat> it's not going to happen another way around. You're not going to sit and debate and argue people into changing. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. And that anointing, you need to get. You need to get it from God. So a lot of people are fighting people and they want acts in place and they want this and they don't want this people here, they don't want that people there and they, what's going on in your heart? If you carried the anointing of Jesus, that person would have gotten into your presence and that person would have gotten free. What do you think will happen the day when a truly anointed person with a truly humble heart, that has truly humbled himself completely, steps into parliament and starts praying for people for deliverance. <laughs> we are not fighting flesh and blood. We are, have chosen to fight flesh and blood. God's not fighting. We, we're fighting the battle in the wrong way, and that's why it's going in the wrong direction for us. So what God is doing is he's just resetting our direction You know, when, when, when God says that, listen, I'm going to come in a way that you haven't seen before. Now, for me, when God said that to me in the word, I said, okay, God, where's my point of reference? Because somewhere in the scripture, I need to look and see something that I can relate to and see. But okay, this, and God said to me, go and check in the early church. What happened when I came in the fullness of my glory in that time? What happened? And remember, the promise is, the latter glory will be greater. But that is a point of reference for us. What happened in that period of time? One thing that you can see is there was massive revival happening in terms of people getting saved, lots of people getting into the kingdom, signs, wonders, and miracles were the norm. It was normal. People had things in common. They had a totally different lifestyle. But God, but then God showed to me there was also that place where when mixture came in and where people wanted to take the glory of God, things went wrong. But that's a positive for us because it shows to us the power of the kingdom. If you go and look in Acts 5 verse 11, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias means grace. Sapphira um, is referring to sapphire, which refers to the tablets of stone on which the law or the Ten Commandments was written. So it's, they, 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 they are a picture of mixture. And what happened with them? They came in an atmosphere where God was in his presence and in his fear there. And they um, sold their property and they um, lied about keeping some of the proceeds to themselves. They pretended that they gave everything. 
the end result for them was that they died. Now, what is that saying to us today? That's saying that when we, we, we pray and we say, as it is in heaven, so let it be on earth. Who is in heaven? God the Father and Jesus. So what we are calling for is we are calling for the heart of the Father and we are calling for the domain of the King. We're calling for the heart of the Father and the domain of the King. So if the domain of the King is what? It's the place where the Lord reigns. It's the place where the Lord is Lord, where the King is Lord. What is Lord? Supreme, maximum, ultimate authority. That means the domain of the king is the place where God rules. It's the place where he kingdom, his kingdom reigns. So when we pray that as it is in heaven and as it is on earth, then actually the throne of God starts moving towards earth. <laughs> and he's coming because he wants to put his footprints in this time. He wants to have glory zones on this earth and where he can put his foot down so that people can see that he is God and that he lives. And he wants to do that through you and me. You are his new thing. You are the ones and we are the church. And there's other churches that God wants to use to be his footprint of glory upon the earth. But he's preparing us to be ready for that. Because what does the word say? When he comes again, he comes with, according to Psalms 2 verse 9 and Revelation 2 verse 27, he comes with a rod of iron. And with that he strikes the nations. So what, what happens? Look what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Look what happened to King Herod in Acts 12. He came at, out, he, he, he gave an oration, and the people honored him as if he was a god, and he didn't give God the glory. Look what the word says. They said to him, the voice of a god and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms. Can you imagine stuff like that happening? <laughs> In the one place you have signs, wonders, miracles, people getting saved. And then there's this place where in this place there's mixture. That's what God's showing me. There's no mixture allowed there. Mixture cannot be there. Compromise cannot be there. The religious spirit cannot be there. We cannot steal the glory of God there. This is the place where God gets the glory, where we are fully devoted to him. And he wants us to know that. So and what am I saying to you? Is God going to come and kill you? No, no, not at all. He loves you too much to put something on you that you cannot carry it. But he's busy preparing you to be able to carry it. So that's what today is about. It's about asking the more and then coming and positioning ourselves and say, Lord, we're going to trust you, Holy Spirit, to help us to position ourselves so that we may carry them all. Because he's going to make room. If we call him down and if he's going to come in his glory, we are going to see how things are shifting. So a lot of the stuff that you are seeing that's being shaken and everything, it's actually the rod of iron. <laughs> Why are you not seeing any leaders? God's preparing. How, how, how many Sundays has Bruce gone to that? Romans 8, 19, the manifestation of the sons of God. Manifestation. So why don't, don't you see any leaders in this world? God's making rooms for his sons. He's making room for his sons. You will never see those men of God, big things anymore. It, God's coming through the sons. He's coming through a company of believers. He's not coming through one man that's taking and running the show. He's coming through all of us. It's just too limited to think that God will only reveal himself through one man in this season. He wants to show his manifold wisdom to the world. He wants to show the world he is true, who he truly is. And that means he wants to give birth to himself through every single believer sitting here today. And that's how he will put down his glory upon this earth. So you have to be open for the new. We had some, we had, when Daniel and them was here, we had a nice little party here, broke into freedom. And it was so awesome because it was something that I think me and Donato, and they, we were contending for that for such a long time because we knew we had to have people step into the freedom of liberty and people have to get used to encounter. But just that next week I was challenged by another guy that, they were actually people that are living in that place of encounter for a long time. 
and, and suddenly he gave a message and he said, yeah, but he calls that the, uh, the charismatic zoo or something. <laughs> and I said to God, but no, listen, God, we're trusting you for this now. Now we break through. Now there's another guy who says, but this is a zoo. And I said, what, what is it now? And God said to me, Ukert, this is not the season where you can prefer one part of me before another. This is the season where I want to come in my fullness, where you have to be open for everything. So it is, it is prayer, it is word, it is worship, it is encounter, it is everything. And we have to let the Holy Spirit be the one to determine what is happening at any given time. If it's a day for freedom and liberty and he wants people to dance and experience encounter and have people set free, then that is what we're going to do. If it's a day for deep devotion and prayer and worship and big digging deeper into God and praying, then that's what we're going to do. But we're not going to take our highlight, current highlight reel and knock off something else that God's doing with somebody else because they are possibly at another day and another time and God's doing something there. He will change the whole atmosphere in this whole building to save and to help one person. Are you willing to roll with that? <laughs> That's how he wants us to be. He doesn't want us to have an agenda. He's got, he, he, he's, he'll go after that one lost sheep and you will sit here and you will experience an atmosphere that's totally not you and you, you haven't gotten what you want, but there was one person that was helped. There was one person that was helped and that was his end goal. So again, I close off with the spirit of, of the bride that says, come. Come, Lord Jesus, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, together with the bride. And let us make room for him in this season. Let us make room for him. How do we make room for God? Corporately, by getting more people. <laughs> because we are his building. So corporately, getting the lost in. Because God is a big God. He's still got a lot of people that he can fill. He... He's building his kingdom and he's building it through people. So one way we make room for him is to prepare for the lost to come in. And are you prepared for the lost to come in? How is it going to look if lots and lots of people from all different kinds of life start streaming into this place? Are you prepared for that? Because that's where this, this thing comes in, is the rod of iron. It cannot be religion cannot be compromised. There cannot be a religious spirit there. there. There has to be this this place where God can do what he wants. What's the other place how you make room for God in your personal life? It's by just going and sitting with the Holy Spirit and saying, Lord, I am your house. And I've got a lot of rooms in my house. And allow him access to everything. Go and look at those places where you may be compromising. Go and look at those places where... You may have a fleshly desire that's taking up or something that's pulling away too much of your attention to God. And just freshly dedicate everything to Him. You know, I forgot after I spoke about um, Saul, I just want to finish off with the example of David that he gave of, of how to, to act when you, when you, do, when you do have, uh, in, a, in a place of responsibility. David made a lot of mistakes. He even made bigger mistakes than Saul did. But we see a different posture with David. We see that David um, was one that took responsibility. When uh, one of the biggest mistakes he made was his extramarital affair with Bathsheba. And we know what happened with him there. And uh, in the end, he ended up putting an arrangement in place that caused her husband to be killed as well. So that's a bad thing. That's really, really bad. And, and he didn't repent at first. God had to send the prophet Nathan to him. And Nathan went to him and Nathan confronted David about this. But when Nathan confronted David, the thing that David said is, I've sinned against God. And he repented. He didn't make any excuse. He didn't give anybody else the, the fault. So what is God saying to you? 
even if you're feeling that you have missed it somewhere and you have lost your authority, you've stepped out and you didn't take responsibility, it's quick and easy for you to get restored. Just take the root of David. Repent. Repent. Just take it and say, Lord, yeah, I was it wrong there. And immediately you can change it. So it's not a difficult thing to change. Just take responsibility for it. Like I say, I've made some bad decisions in my life. And it would be great for me to blame my friends and my family and maybe my auntie that made me fall on my head when I was three. But it's not going to help me. <laughs> it's not going to help me. Blaming other people, blaming other things is not going to help. It's, and, and like I say, the enemy wants you to shy away because he May, wants you to feel that that's a place of condemnation and that's the place where God's not pleased with you. That's the place where God, he already paid. He already made the call that I'm going to write off the debt. But he still wants you free from it. He still wants you to not repeat a mistake. He still wants you to, to get the grace and the mercy to make better decisions maybe. So, yeah, that's the message that I have for you guys today. Um, I hope it meant something to you. And I would still like to pray for us because the word was ended in a way that God said, I'm looking for those with integrity. I'm looking for those that will take, now maybe just a quick one on integrity. David also our example of integrity. Look at David when he was in the, uh, uh, in the position that he was in. He was anointed as king. Saul was still in office. David knew he was king and, and he was married to Saul's daughter and he was loyal to Saul. And what happened when David um, got in a position where Saul started getting jealous of him? Then Saul started pursuing him to kill him. And David, obviously for me, is this example of that what we said he had the strong kingdom principles and integrity. What is one of the kingdom principles? Do not touch God's anointed. Do its prophets no harm. So what did, what did David do? He had two opportunities to take Saul out. He didn't take those opportunities. Even in the end when Saul died, David lamented for him and made certain that he got a proper burial. After Saul died, there was still a battle between um, Israel ach, between the house of David and the house of Saul because David was king of Judah but not yet of Israel and there was a long battle until David got kingship of everything and nobody of Saul's family was left none of his male heirs was left except for one a son of Jonathan his brother and David had the opportunity to just take everything that Saul had but he had a covenant with Jonathan. Nobody knew of that covenant. Nobody. It was something that he and Jonathan did. But what did he do? He found that one son of Jonathan who was crippled and he restored all of the property of Saul to Mephibosheth. Can you believe it? The integrity of David. The integrity. Nobody would have even known <laughs> that he didn't meet his agreement with, with, with Jonathan. But he did it, and he did it to the fullest extent by giving him everything, all the land of Saul. And he even gave him people to work those lands, and he had him eat with him in the castle. That's the integrity. That's the type of people that need to walk this earth again, a people that can blow the world's mind by saying, why are these people so honest? <laughs> why would you do that? A people that would be obedient even if it, if it hurts. So the word ended off saying, will you take responsibility? Will you be that people? So I'm going to ask you if you are willing today to, to say yes to that. And in the yes, it's not something that I want to look for in yourself because it's not in you. It's a grace that we're going to ask for God today for, to help us to be those people. Because in ourselves, in myself, I cannot live that life. <laughs> I, it, it, in me, I'm not that honest. <laughs> I am honest about that. 
but I need His grace. I need Him to empower me and to help me and to say, but Lord, I, I want to, I want, I, I'm in. So if you're in today with me, I want to ask you to stand. Thank you, Holy Spirit, and thank you, Father, for, for this day and for this people. Lord, I know some of what was said was, was hard to hear, but Lord, I, I know that you love them so much, and you want cycles of failure to stop today. You want people set free. You want people to be in a place where they will walk in the fullness of what you have for them. And Lord, we have been crying out individually and as a church for the more and you've answered us today by saying that you, you're going to bring it. You're going to bring it. So in this place where we know that with, with whatever is coming, there will be a place where we are going to re be required to take more responsibility, where we are going to be required to walk in an integrity that we as, as individuals and as people don't carry, Lord. We come today and we humble ourselves before your throne of grace. And we ask for help in this time of need. We ask that your Holy Spirit will come and heal every broken part and, 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 and everything that is not of you. And that you will give us today the grace to change and to stand into this more and to stand in the more. So today, Lord, I ask corporately and individually that you will process your people, each one of them, and position them perfectly for the more that you're going to give them. And thank you, Lord, that none of them will miss out anything that you have for them. And none of them will miss it. I call forth heaven and earth to be witness today. And that all resources that's required in heaven and on earth will now cooperate with what you want to do in this church, in our area, in our region in our country and into the individual lives of these people. That you will allocate to them the angels that need to help, the resources, the wisdom, the strength, the boldness, the courage, but that you will also reinforce them with this anointing of being responsible, being in this excellent spirit that Daniel was, ten times better than anyone else, and that they will be at this place where they will Stand in the place of responsibility and not give away their authority. In any place where any of these people have given away their authority today, Lord, we humble ourselves before you and we say sorry for the place where we have allowed the enemy to steal our authority. We take it back today, Jesus, because you paid for us to give it, get it back. You paid for us to get it back. So by the blood of the Lamb, I set you free from any place of compromise. And the blood speaks a better word for you today. And the blood says, what is yours is coming back to you. And you get your authority and your position before God back today by the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen.